Contact a Family is a UK charity providing information and support to families with disabled children, whatever their disability. This podcast is an honest account of a mother's experience of having a disabled child. I'm the mum of five children and I've got a husband and the second of the five is a young man now who is 22. His name is Harry and he has severe learning difficulties and autism and the other children are thankfully very well. When did you feel that there was something wrong with Harry or that you were concerned about his development? Harry was born at full term and he was completely ordinary when he was born. Nobody noticed anything different about him and neither did I. And he's our second baby so I sort of had something to compare him with and didn't notice anything at all. And he appeared to be meeting all the targets. But just after he was a year old he would started a bit of babbling, a little bit of um, chatting, noises and things like that. But we suddenly realised that he'd stopped making some of the noises he was making before. So by the time he was 16 months we were really quite concerned concerned about his development because he just didn't seem to be doing what we would expect him to do and in particular he didn't seem to respond when his dad came home from work for example instead of running up to see him he didn't seem to be that bothered whether his dad was there or not we thought that was a bit strange and we kind of thought he might be deaf I took him to see the GP and the GP who I had at the time said that actually there probably wasn't anything wrong with Harry and that I was just being overprotective that I was anticipating his behavior therefore he wasn't having to ask me for anything and that also because he had an older sibling who was particularly bright that I was comparing him and I was actually quite relieved at that because I thought right if it's me that's wrong I can change and my child's going to be okay but sadly that didn't happen and later on by the time he was about 18 months old by then I'd had another child so I had three children and there was something wrong with the baby so I took her to see the GP and Harry was running up and down in the doctor's surgery wouldn't listen to what I said I was asking him to sit down he didn't take any notice and I just looked at the GP and I said look um this is why I think he might be deaf because he's not listening to what I'm saying and the GP just said to me "Uh, oh no this behavior is not indicative of somebody who's deaf this is indicative of a child with some sort of mental retardation and so that's when I found out when he was about 18 months old in a really difficult way that that's what the professionals might think it was. And did the doctor offer you any support at that time or did you just leave the doctor's surgery feeling completely bewildered? Yes, he, the doctor asked very kindly if I'd got an attendance allowance for him and I didn't know what an attendance allowance was. These days it's called disability living allowance but of course I said to him I don't know what you're talking about and he said oh he looks like he's a real handful. So yes as you quite rightly say I swept up him and the baby and walked out of the surgery in a complete daze. Where did you go from there? I actually changed my GP because I was so upset. I changed to another GP who was absolutely brilliant and she has been really supportive ever since. She gave us an appointment to have his hearing checked again. The audiologist said she didn't feel that his hearing was at fault. We had an appointment then with a paediatrician by the time he was 22 months old. In that time, his behaviour regressed so much, we started looking up in books. And we kind of made the diagnosis ourselves because his behaviour was classically autistic. When we saw the paediatrician, he just sort of started talking very vaguely about, oh, it's a global developmental delay. So I actually asked him outright and said, do you think this child could be autistic? And he said, well, actually, yes, his behaviour is leaning in that direction. So really, he kind of knew, but 22 months is very, very young. You don't usually get a diagnosis quite as early as that. So we then waited and went on and had another appointment up at the Maudsley Hospital where they've got a a big diagnostic unit and we got the confirmation of the diagnosis there. You mentioned that your GP first suggested that you should be getting some financial support because he needed a lot of care. How did you find out what benefits you were entitled to? We actually found out in the end from somebody from the Portage Service because Harry had this developmental delay having seen the paediatrician one of the things that was put in place was he referred us to something called Portage which is a preschool home education package and this was a portage teacher who used to come into our home every week and she was absolutely brilliant it was like a lifeline for me because it was actually somebody who knew all about the sort of delay that Harry had and and she was absolutely brilliant and she it was she who actually alerted me to applying for various benefits which I was really reluctant to do at the beginning because I, I didn't understand why he was likely to cost any more money than any other child but she pointed out to me how much money I was spending on extra toys extra books all the transport back backwards and forwards to appointments and all those things. So we did apply and we did get what's now called disability living allowance. We also had a referral to speech and language therapy and he was also referred to a special needs playgroup. But I was also taking him to a mainstream playgroup myself because I was really
really hoping he would be able to integrate with mainstream children. But I had to stay with him the whole time. And actually, he, he didn't really fit in terribly well because the condition he's got means that he was particularly um, socially inept. And having lots of other children around kind of irritated him. He was better off in a quieter and more structured environment. That must have been really hard to manage with other children who were attending the mainstream playgroups. It was. It was a time in my life when all I can remember is putting children in the backs of cars and driving places, in and out, and buggies. It's all gone a bit of a blur now. You just get on with it at the time. Looking back, it was quite hectic. And it was at that point that we also started his educational statement process because it was obvious by then he wasn't going to manage in a mainstream environment. He would need a special school. I, I couldn't come to terms with the fact that he needed to go to a special school straight away. I really wanted him to go to an ordinary school, but he just simply couldn't cope. I think that year was was a really tough time because that was a lot of coming to terms. I had the other two children as well, so mm. there was a lot there was a lot going on. Were there any specific support groups available around autism at that time? I asked the portage worker if I could meet some other parents who had children like Harry and she said at the time although I don't know anyone else that would fit the bill so I did a bit of research myself and in the end there were four mums who got together and we actually set up the support group ourselves and that was in 1988. For the first year it was just the four of us meeting in each other's homes and then we got the social worker involved who was brilliant because she helped us set it up formally and then gradually more and more people came along. My husband joined the group as well so between us and the social worker we ran that group for about 30 13 years. By the time I handed it over to someone else to run, there were 96 people. You have five children and your husband. How did you manage all of that, your family life? And yeah. Were you working at the time? And I didn't have a paid job. I was a full-time mother in those days. My husband's really supportive. So my parents were really supportive. They didn't live, they didn't live nearby, uh, neither do my in-laws, but they were always really helpful if we needed any extra support. We lived in this chaotic state for quite a few years and a sleepless state, I have to say. We managed without sleep. We used to take things in turns, so we used to do a shift at night because Harry didn't sleep in those days very rarely slept at all so one of us would stay with him from 11 until 3 and the other one would go in between 3 and 7 and thereby me ensuring that you got at least four hours sleep if one of the others didn't wake up bearing in mind that Bob was also working full-time at the time mm. so it was actually quite tough for a couple of years but it was all worth it in the end because everyone's grown up very close the family the, the other siblings are very close to each other the other siblings did they attend any groups well the group that we set up one of the things we did was on a Sunday afternoon we organized a, a group meeting and that was for the whole family so our youngsters were able to mix with them and they sort of formed their own kind of bond but it wasn't a formalized group with a psychologist or anything at one point in the borough that was set up but my kids didn't want to go but I think it was a very useful exercise for some of the parents particularly if you have just two children if you've got one child with a disability and then you've got a sibling who hasn't got a disability it's a much needed thing for them I think you you spoke a little bit um, before you were saying the most difficult time for you was when Harry was small? I would say that none of it's easy. At the very beginning, it's particularly difficult because you're coming to terms with the whole process of not having a child who you were expecting to have and welcoming a new child to your family, really. And it's really quite different, and that's a big challenge. And then you learn to live and you learn to set your life up and you, you, you get on with stuff. But I would say the next really difficult time for us was the transition from children's services and into adult services. And that was a challenge because it's a different world. But I think once, once people have got through that diagnosis period, the next bit on, hopefully you reach some sort of plateau where you have got the services and you have found where the support is and you found some friends, hopefully, and you may have found people who've got children with the same condition as yours, and that's really helpful. And if you can go out there and do that, got people with common interests, uh, and then it's, it makes life much easier, in, as, as easy as it can be. Um, and then and then you have to face the adult thing, but that's later on. Tell me a little bit about Harry now. Harry is now 22, and he lives with six other men who've all got autism in one house. It's a really big house. He's got his own place. He's got his own bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. He still has high level support needs, but he basically is out and about in the community every day. They've tried all sorts of things with him in terms of activities like horse riding. He likes swimming. He likes to go for walks. They still go to sort of adventure playgrounds. He's still very active. And at one point he had a small volunteering role. It didn't work out, but they've tried all sorts of things with him and they continue to try all sorts of things with him. And he still makes progress. I would say that he is much more able than I was expecting him to be. 
when he was little. And as to the future, are you confident about Harry's future? I will always have concerns for his future, and that's because he is a non-verbal young man, and therefore it's very hard for me to work out what's happening in his life. It's quite difficult when they become adults because you don't want to be on their case the whole time, but there is still that underlying feeling that as his mother, I ought to be sure of, of how things are. So I'll always be concerned, but I'm really fortunate because his brother and sisters are also concerned about him, and because there were four of them hopefully the task won't be too onerous for them to at least keep in touch because obviously the biggest concern for most parents is what's going to happen when we're not here and the child still is and uh, yeah our concern really is to make sure that we build up a really good base for him so that we can be confident that everything will be okay. The Contact a Family Helpline can provide information and support on many of the points raised in this podcast. The advisors on our free phone helpline can assist with issues around benefits entitlement, navigating the NHS and issues around education. We can also locate local and national support groups, provide medical information and link parents whose children have rare disorders. In addition, we produce a wide range of publications. For further information, visit our website at www.cafamily.org.uk or call our free phone helpline on 0808 808 3555. For video interviews with parents, visit our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash CA family. This recording was made in May 2008.